Thank you. And if you would turn with me in your Bibles today to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. If you're using the Black Bible, that's page 45 in the New Testament. And if you're using the Blue Bible with a little bitty print, that's page 498. You know, this time of year, retail businesses usually engage in a practice known as inventory. That is, they take a look at what they have sold and what they have left on their shelves, and it gives them somewhat of an idea of what to expect for the next year. Today, I want to speak on the subject, taking spiritual inventory. And as we discuss this topic, I want to steer away from the usual practice of making New Year's resolutions, which we know most of which will never be kept, right? You know, diet, fitness, financial goals, all those things certainly do have their place. But they all represent what is temporary, that which will not last. And so let's keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is your relationship with God, and that is eternal. And so today as we talk about this, I want, to ask, I want us to ask ourselves three questions that will pretty much identify where we are at spiritually as we head into the new year. And if you would, look with me at the latter half of Luke chapter 2. Lost in the awesomeness of the Christmas story is what happens next in the life of Jesus and his earthly parents. So if you would, look with me now at verse 21. And by the way, you can keep your Bibles open to that passage. We'll be there all morning long, and I won't ask you to turn anyplace else. Verse 21, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, so now Jesus was eight days old, and it was time to be circumcised. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you can go talk to Pastor Lane at the end of the service, and he has prepared uh, a dossier for you that you can learn everything there is to know about circumcision. But from this point on, we're going to assume that you know what I'm talking about. Thousands of years earlier, God had instructed Abraham to have all of his male descendants circumcised on the eighth day. Now, why the eighth day? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, rabbis taught that uh, they wanted the child, God wanted the child to have experienced a Sabbath day or a holy day before their circumcision. Medically, some have weighed in and said that the presence of vitamin K in the bloodstream of the male child is highest on the eighth day. I haven't read any peer-reviewed articles about that, but I have seen that come up several times in my reading. I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly makes sense. It says, eight days had passed before his circumcision. His name was then called Jesus, which of course means Yahweh saves. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, now 33 days have passed. And according to the law of Moses, there were some things... Uh, regarding their covenant relationship with God that had to be taken care of according to, uh, for Mary and Jesus. And so they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Mary and Joseph undertake a trip to Jerusalem to really do three things. First of all, Mary had to offer a sacrifice for her own purification because according to the Bible, the birthing process rendered her ceremonially unclean, and so she had to offer a sacrifice. Now you're thinking, well, that's not very fair for women. Well, there were also other health issues that men had to offer uh, purification sacrifices for. But we see here that Mary did not offer a lamb because they were poor and they could not afford it. So she offered the alternative sacrifice of turtle doves or pigeons. Secondly, since Jesus was the firstborn son, Joseph and Mary were required to pay a temple tax of five shekels to redeem him from the temple since the firstborn son belonged to the Lord. This was so for every household in Israel. And then, of course, they had to dedicate him to the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see in all of this. Mary and Joseph knew that they had God in the flesh living in their house. That is, God in human form had come down from heaven and had submitted himself to their earthly care. 
but still they understood the importance of spiritual priorities. They circumcised him. They paid the five shekels. They presented him at the temple. They did exactly what God had commanded every family to do in Israel. They had priorities. Their spiritual life was something of great significance, not only to them personally, but also to their entire family. So let us ask ourselves this first question. What are my priorities? What are my priorities? Now, a priority is defined as something that is given special attention, meaning that it is so important to you that you will go to great lengths to make sure that it happens. Let me illustrate. Back in 2011, I came home in the middle of the week, and, and my wife was working a much earlier shift, and she got home before I did. And uh, she broke to me the bad news that her father had gotten laid off from his job. And uh, that had, you know, wasn't uncommon for the line of work he was in since Vietnam. Uh, he had been a welder. He'd picked up that skill in the Navy. In fact, uh, he was he certified so high as a welder, he actually could weld underwater. But from time to time, he would get laid off. And, and I know my wife had shared with me things, you know, from her childhood. I remember dad getting laid off. So I just determined, hey, enough with you getting laid off in Oregon. I went and talked to a friend of mine who worked at Nebraska Boiler. And I said, hey, do you guys have any jobs for a guy that could, you know, has a certification as high as he does? He goes, oh, we'd hire him just like that. So I got excited. And I said, after all these years, I'm finally going to get to have my father-in-law and my mother-in-law live close to me. And I'll have to stop making jokes about my mother-in-law like I do so frequently. But I, I can adjust. And so I got on the phone and I said, Craig, I'm sorry to hear you got laid off. But hey, guess what? You can leave the balmy, warm northwest coast of Oregon and you can move to the sunny capital of Lincoln, Nebraska. We have beautiful winters here. Wouldn't you just love it? I was thinking he was going to be all excited. You know what he said? He said, I'm not interested. And I said, why is that? He goes, I'm through with welding. I go, what are you going to do? He says, I am retiring. And I said, well, I didn't realize you were, oh, yeah, I'm able to retire. I said, well, Craig, what are you going to do in retirement? Show this next slide. This is what he does in retirement. He said, I am going to fish. And ever since I've known my father-in-law, I mean, he's a great fisherman. You ought to see his gear. You ought to see his equipment. He gets up now in retirement, not every morning, but a lot of mornings at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning to beat a trail to this place right here, the Columbia River. You've been there, haven't you, Pastor? Isn't it gorgeous? He has a special spot picked out on the Columbia River that he gets there. And look at this. Hell knows no fury if he gets there and somebody has taken his spot. He can get violent. I mean, really, if somebody takes his fishing spot. And uh, he gets up and goes. You know why? Because it is a great priority to him. In fact, a couple months ago, my wife went and visited her folks for a couple of, a couple of, week, a couple of weeks. And when she got back, I said, hey, how's your dad doing? And she says, I'm really getting worried about him. And I said, what's the matter? She goes, he's worrying himself down, gets up every morning and goes fishing. And I said, oh, that's a horrible way to live, isn't it? <laughs> Wearing himself down, going fishing. Think with me right now, what are the things in your life that are most important to you? What are those things that they're top of the list for you, and, and you're going to make sure they happen? Now, ponder this. How much time and resources do you invest in your spiritual life, in your walk with God? Back when I was in college, I heard a quote from a visiting pastor, Dr. Curtis Hudson. I think you know him well, Carl. And Curtis Hudson told us that the only difference between you now and a year from now are two things. The people you meet and the books you read. Let that sink in. The things that will impact you most over the next year are the people that you come in contact with, that you build relationships with, and the books you read. Now think with me right now. Imagine how radically different your life would be one year from right now if you read God's book above all and if you spent time in his presence. Mary and Joseph had priorities. Jesus had to be circumcised. They had to pay the temple tax. Mary had to offer a sacrifice. We don't do those things anymore. But here are some practical spiritual priorities that I want to remind us all of this morning. Write these things. That's nothing earth shattering. It's nothing academic. It's just some simple reminders. These are priorities we should have as we head into 2018. Number one is attend church every week. That means you don't miss unless you're providentially hindered. You know, we need you here. 
We don't need you here just to count noses. We're not here just to inflate our attendance. We don't count you for those reasons. The reason you need to be here is because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have, have accepted Him as your Savior, upon the moment of your conversion, the Holy Spirit of God gave you spiritual gifts. And those gifts are to be used in this local assembly. You are to use them serving our community and reaching the world. And I want to challenge us all in 2018 to take our attendance from the casual to the committed. And the body of Christ needs you to be here. We need the contributions through the Holy Spirit through your attendance. Secondly, write this down. Read the Bible every day and journal. You know, when I was in middle school, our church uh, took us to a camp in Dayton, Tennessee. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and we made the trek every summer up to Fort Bluff Camp in Dayton, Tennessee. And it's funny, after all these years, I have a couple of friends from college that actually run this camp facility now. And it's a lot like the camp that we take our kids to at Maranatha in, in, in uh, Maxwell, Nebraska. Just a lot of fun stuff. But on a Friday afternoon, the last day of camp, I'll never forget, they did something that made no sense to us. They brought in an ancient-looking pastor. I mean, he looked 400 years old to speak to a bunch of... I mean, there were like 700 campers at that camp this week. And <clears throat> on a Friday afternoon, right in the middle of the afternoon when activities were supposed to be going on, we all assembled in kind of like an open-air tabernacle, open tabernacle. And there he spoke for about 20 minutes, and he even wore a suit. I mean, can you get any more weird than that? Even in the 80s, he was at camp, and he was wearing a double-breasted suit. And I'll never forget he spoke on that topic. I have forgotten every sermon that, that was preached that week. And, man, we got a lot of sermons that week at camp. I remember this one. You know what it was? Read the Bible. He looked at us and said, read the Bible. And then he went so far as to tell us how to read the Bible. He said, you guys need to read four chapters a day. And if you'll read four chapters a day, you can read through the entire Bible in one year. And then if you do that your entire life, I guarantee God will use you. Well, guess what? I, uh, I followed his advice, and that was 34 years ago. Tomorrow starts a new year. Try it. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but think with me, how many of you have read the entire Bible? We were in Nicaragua a few years ago, and we were sitting around a circle. We were doing our quiet time, and one of our students closed his Bible, looked at me, and said, Pastor Steve, I did it. I said, what'd you do? He said, I just finished Revelation 22. I've just read the entire Bible through. You can do it one of two ways. You can read three chapters from the Old Testament and then one chapter from the New Testament. You can read four chapters a day, go straight through. That's the way I read it. That's the way real men do it. You just read it straight through, all right? Uh, pastor yesterday when I was sharing this with him said there's really another way, and that is you could read three chapters a day and then read five on Sunday. But you know, God inspired and preserved 66 books that make up His Holy Word. And sadly, most of His children have never read the love letter from God in its entirety. But there's another step you need to take, and that is you need to journal. Now, when I moved here in 2000, I was reading the Bible, but Pastor Carl introduced me to journaling. And that is, go down to the convenience store. Store, get a 99-cent composition book, and write the day's date at the top of the page, and then write the passage of Scripture that you read. And then, you know, after you read the, that passage of Scripture, pick out a part of it that, 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 that really spoke to you, and write down a few thoughts. And I tell you this, it will take your Bible reading to a whole new level. And get this, imagine if you do this for several years. I've been doing this now for 17 years and I've got filed away a box of composition books that is a written legacy of my journey through God's Word. Now imagine when they put you in the ground after the sloppy joes are eaten here at church that Karen Boss fixes so well for every funeral, okay? And they go back and now your kids are sorting through your things and they discover that for years dad walked with God. That for years faithfully Mom walked with God, and they left a written record of that journey. Hey, read God's Word. Thirdly, write this down, pray every day. What does your prayer life look like? Here's what the prayer life sounds like of most believers. You ready? Good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. 
Is that the depth of your prayers? Maybe if it's not that, maybe you take it up a little level and before you go to bed, now lay me down to sleep. And before you make your request, you're off to sleep, right? You know, in that same composition book, leave the first page blank and write at the top your prayer list. Let me tell you the first two things to put on that prayer list. The first thing is thanksgiving. And that is you spend some time thanking God every day for who He is and specifically for what He has done in your life. Number two is forgiveness. That is, you take, back, you take time and look back over the course of your day and you ask God for forgiveness for all. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind the things that you've done that you need to ask forgiveness for. And this is also a good time to forgive those who have wronged you. And then just put down your request. Let your requests be made known to God, Philippians says. And you just go through there and you just write down everything and you pray for people, you pray for your relatives, you pray for people you love. As Lisa said, you especially pray for people that you don't love and uh, you'll find out that you'll be able to get along with them a little better if you do that. One year from today, I guarantee you that your life will be significantly different if you will do these things, but you've got to make it a priority. Number two, let's move on to the second question and that is... How is my patience? What are my priorities? How is my patience? Verse 25, And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous. What does that mean? Well, in Greek, that is dikaios, which means that he was just and upright in the way that he treated people. It also says that he was devout, this comes from the Greek word eulabase, which means that Simeon had reverent awe when he was in the presence of God. So he was right before God and men. The Bible says that he was looking. Some translations have it that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, what is, what is the consolation of Israel? Well, when Luke mentions the consolation of Israel, what he's talking about is the age of the Messiah that, of course, would appear with his coming, would result in salvation being available to every human being through his sacrifice on the cross, but it ultimately would culminate in the fact when he does away with all evil and reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords forever. Simply put, Simeon was waiting for Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. All those decades, this faithful, humble servant of God had been in the temple. And he'd been walking with God. And he'd been in God's presence. And one day the Holy Spirit revealed to him, Pal, you are not going to die until with your own eyes you see the Messiah. And all these years, he had just been patiently waiting on God to make good on that promise. Look at verse 27. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents, that's Mary and Joseph, brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and he blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. When Simeon, after all those years patiently waiting on God to make good on a promise, when he finally held Jesus, the month-old Jesus, in his arms, his heart just melted and he said, God, it's okay for me to die now because you have fulfilled your promise. <laughs> and then he says... For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Simeon knew that in his arms he held the one that would bring the Gentile world out of darkness and into the light of God's truth. But he also said he's going to be the glory of your people Israel. Now, he's not going to be the glory at first. But ultimately, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So this guy's going to be the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. And then notice verse 33. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Which Mary and Joseph were looking at each other and they're going, Wow, did you know that he was going to be the light of truth to the Gentiles? No, I didn't know. The glory of all Israel from us? 
Had no idea. And so then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. We have observed here at our church on dozens of occasions through the years, baby dedications. Aren't they just sweet? Aren't they just something wonderful to behold? You got Grandpa Pastor Carl up here, and like Simeon, not quite as aged, okay? <laughs> Been here for decades. You know, he takes your son or your daughter in their arms, and, uh, you know, he usually says very nice things about them. Oh, they're so cute. Looks like their mother. Certainly don't look like their father. What would you think if while Pastor Carl was holding your baby... He all of a sudden were to say, boy, this is a wonderful little kid here, but man, he's really going to stir up some trouble in this country. I mean, he is really going to be a point of division. In fact, he's going to be the reason many people succeed and many people fail. You know, that's exactly what Simeon did that day. He, he, was, he was prophesying about the ministry of the Messiah. He said, listen, those who accept the claims that this baby will make as God's son will rise. Those who do not accept this, they're going to fall. Then he goes on further, and he says that uh, he would be a sign to be oppressed. And that is, before he's the glory of Israel, he is going to be rejected. Now let's talk a little bit about that awful word called rejection, because it's a tough thing to deal with. Have you ever been rejected at some point? Um, you know, you apply for a job, and you're thinking, man, this is, this is my big break. I'm going to get this job, and it's going to be more money, and my family's going to be able to do better. And then all of a sudden, you get a letter or a phone call or an email. Yeah, I see some of you shaking your heads. It's happened to you. It went to somebody else, right? Uh, that's tough. Remember when you were a teenager, and you asked the girl out for a date? And in, oh, 50 words or less, she said, you're a creep, right? Get lost. You remember how painful that was? How about this? Maybe you've experienced rejection at a much deeper level. Maybe you've had a, a spouse betray you and be unfaithful to you. You know, whenever that happens, remember that as the perfect, sinless son of God who could claim his right to Israel's throne, Jesus, was likewise rejected. That is, he also was the son of man, but he was the son of God. He was the creator and sustainer of the universe, so he could have come in, set up shop, and said, hey, my way or the highway, take it or leave it. But instead, he suffered rejection. But not only would Jesus suffer, look next at what Simeon says. He's talking to Mary now, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. He says, Mary, not only is Jesus going to suffer, but as his earthly mother, you are going to suffer with him. Not physically, but when you see all of the false accusations, the misrepresentations, the betrayal, and ultimately the crucifixion, it's going to be like a sword is going to pierce your very soul. And what Simeon was saying was the age of the Messiah has come, but preceding the crown, there has to be the cross. And the lesson that I believe God wants us to learn here is patience. That we have to be willing to wait on God and allow Him to work out everything according to His plan and in His time. If you read the Bible through, which I hope many of you will take the challenge and do that this year, you will see through the Scriptures that God never goes into a two-minute offense. God never gets in a hurry. In Genesis, he promised Abraham a son when he was in his 70s. And you would think with the clock ticking that God kind of would have made that happen in a hurry. But instead, God waited the better part of two decades until Abraham was in his 90s before Isaac was born. Moses spent 40 years in the backside of the wilderness. And finally, God spoke to him out of a burning bush when he was about 80 years old and said, Moses, okay, it's time. You know, kind of now or never, God, I'm 80 years old. It's time to go back to Egypt, look Pharaoh in the face and say, let my people go. God anointed David to be king, but yet David went for many years while Saul still occupied the throne. You know why? In all of those cases, God was trying to teach patience because God does not keep the same calendar that you and I do. He has his own. 
You know, let me, let me give you an illustration. Um, and I'm going to talk to just the men today. Because men, would you not heartily agree that women do way better in the area of patience than we do? Wouldn't you agree? I don't know, but my wife has gobs and gobs more patience than I do. You know, we hear a lot of running stories around here at Calvary because Pastor Carl runs. And uh, from whether it's a bombing in Boston, where he's a mile from, or whether it's getting arrested in Canada for reasons that I will not go into, okay? Uh, you all know the reason why. He didn't do anything wrong. When Carl goes to run a marathon, you never know what's going to happen, right? You just don't know the drama that's involved. I also compete in a sport, you know, called powerlifting. And, um, you know, I know looking at me today, many of you think I'm a figure skater, but no, I'm not, okay? Um, but, you know, I don't tell many powerlifting stories. You know why? Because they're boring. I mean... You go out there, you lift the weight, you set it down. You know, if you make the weight, great. Maybe the judges, there's just not a whole lot of drama involved. But I like to tell stories about a, about a sport that I really love, as I'm a huge fight fan. And by the way, Pastor Hugo was a boxer in El Salvador. And when I get together with Hugo, we talk about some of the fights that he had in El Salvador as a boxer. And he, know, he comes to my house and we watch boxing. You know, there's no greater example of patience in the sports world than this guy right here. This is Big George Foreman. You know him better by the George Foreman grill. But before there was George Foreman the grill, there was George Foreman the fighter. And before there was the wonderful character we've come to know in my generation, there was this guy, and he was not very likable. In fact, every sportscaster said they hated to be around him because he was so hateful and so mean. I mean, he hated everybody. He was filled with rage. And when he fought, that rage would come out as he would just maul his opponents. In fact, by the time he got around to fighting Muhammad Ali, he had wreaked such havoc in the ring that many people feared he's going to kill Muhammad Ali. Literally, it would be the end of Ali's life. Well, you know what happened. That faithful night in Kinshasa, Zaire in 1973, Ali cemented his legacy by beating George Foreman, and yet George Foreman's uh, le legacy of invincibility was stripped from him. And so for several years, he entered into depression. He fought unimpressively. And one night after he lost a close decision, literally at the point of despair, he met Jesus Christ. And he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people around him said instantly his life changed. Now, many of us, we get saved. It takes a while to realize there's change taking place. But with Big George, it was instantaneous. He gave his life to Christ. He began preaching the gospel around the globe. He took his resources that he had earned boxing, and he built a church in Houston, Texas. And then he built a youth center, and he stayed retired 10 years. And finally, his bookkeeper came to him and said, George, you're running out of money. You're going to have to close the youth center. You're going to have to close the church. He says, I can't do that. So at age 38... He started boxing again, and he was the laughing stock of the division, but he just kept winning, and he kept beating more and more people, and finally, in 1995, he got a shot at the heavyweight title, and I've watched this fight probably a dozen times to hear the jeers, to hear the mockery, the unprofessional comments from the commentators until the 10th round. His opponent, who, by the way, was 36-0 and 0 with 33 knockouts and was 17 years younger than George. George was 45 at this time. George landed that big right hand in the 10th round, a single punch, and Michael Moore hit the floor like a sack of flour. And the HBO commentator said, it happened. And Big George that night was wearing the same trunks that he had worn the night he had lost to Ali 20 years earlier. And now, not filled with hate, but filled with gratitude, Big George got over in the corner and he dropped to his knees and he thanked God and held his hands to heaven. You know why? Because after 20 years, the bad memory, the hurt, the pain of loss had finally gone away through victory. You know, going into the new year, how is your patience? Is there a hurt from your past? Maybe there's a goal that burns deep inside of you that just won't go away. Is your faith strong enough to trust God to do things on His timetable, not your own? Write this down. When God works, 
is just as significant as how God works. What God does and when he does it goes hand in hand. Let's wrap this up with this third question. Who is your passion? And what we speak here of is who do you love the most? Now there's another character in this story, verse 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. Luke puts this very nicely. She was advanced in years. Okay, that means that she was old. And she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84. So get this picture. Here is a, a young woman. She's married for seven years. And then one of the worst things that could happen to a woman in that time period was she lost her husband. She lost her provider. And after only seven years of marriage, now she's been a widow all of these years. So what did she do? Luke recorded that she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. With the love of her life gone, Anna simply fell in love with God, and she devoted herself to Him fully. You see, to her, God had become her all-consuming passion. And so now she happens to be there when Simeon is holding Jesus in his arms. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to him, of him, to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. What did she do? She looked around as she saw the Christ child and she began telling everybody, hey, if you're looking for peace, if you're looking for redemption, look no further. It's right there in Simeon's arms. And if you would, write this last thing down, who we love determines how we act. Who we love most impacts our behavior. You see, I'm in love with my wife. That's why that I put the dishes in the dishwasher instead of the sink. It's just far more convenient to leave them in the sink, right? But instead, I take an extra step and I put them in the dishwasher. I pick up my dirty socks. I try to behave during athletic events, at least when she's there, right? Um, <laughs> You know why? Because I know that those behaviors and a lot of others don't please her. And because I love her, I want to please her. You remember last fall when Pastor Carl mentioned during our study of Joseph that what sustained Joseph the most during his time in slavery and in prison was that he had a dream that was bigger than his temptation. And we all struggle with temptation, don't we? In fact, most of us just skip the temptation and we just flat out struggle with sinning, correct? The key to victory over sin, whatever it might be in our lives, doesn't lie in just modifying our behavior. You see, it doesn't lie if we have a particular sin, we just got to stop doing that. It doesn't work that way. The key to victory over sin is spiritual transformation. Behavior modification is outside in and it's temporary at best. Spiritual transformation is inside out. It's a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And how does spiritual transformation happen? You have to fall in love with Jesus. And in His presence, you have to experience that transformative, unconditional, changing love. And, to the point, and you get to the point where you love Jesus more than you love your sin. And it begins to affect the way you act and your choices. You need to make Jesus your passion, just like Anna did. Who do you love most in your life? Do you love Jesus with an all-consuming passion? As 2017 closes, let us reflect upon these three key questions. What are my priorities? Are there any idols in your life? Is there anything that takes first place instead of God? Hey, make God first in your life. How are you doing in the area of patience? You know, are you willing to wait upon God? Can you sit by quietly, peacefully, knowing that in His time God is going to do and God is going to fulfill in your life the promises that He has made? Can you trust Him through that? And then last of all, who is my passion? Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Do you love God that way? I hope you do. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you've done in our lives this year. Lord, we thank you 
that in Revelation, your son sits on the throne after he's wiped away every tear from every eye and there's no more sorrow and there's no more pain and there's no more dying, Lord, because the former things have passed away. God, he then sits on the throne and says, Behold, I make all things new. And God, this time of year, we, we look forward to the new year and the new opportunities. God, we just pray that in 2018 that you would be our utmost priority, that these earthly passions and desires and pursuits Lord, would just fall away. God, that we would just pursue you. God, help us, give us your grace and the patience that we need to go from day to day, knowing that you're in control, and Lord, that everything is going to be okay in your hands. And then God, help us just to love you more. God, we just pray that we would see the world through the eyes of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, that not only would we love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, but God, that also that we would love our neighbor as ourself. And God, if there's someone here today, Lord, in this smaller crowd due to the weather, God, maybe they don't know you as their personal Savior. I pray that today, Lord, that they would accept you as their Savior and that they would, Lord, call upon you for salvation. For these things we pray in your name. Amen.